Okay, well, thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thanks to the organisers for asking me along today to come and talk about this work. And um, uh, it's an, uh, I'm going to take an approach which is a physicalist approach. Um, I'm really asking a very simple question of uh, uh, can we tell what's going on inside human brains? I used to work on, you know, fMRI scans and things like that, but of course the voxels there don't really get down to the resolution that we actually need. So instead, uh, today we're going to work bottom up. And uh, my co-authors in this are Chris Lester, who works with me here in the Maths Institute, who's in the room. Chris, all right, there, there he is, yeah. And uh, Clive Bowman, who's a visiting industrial professor, Royal Society visiting industrial professor, who I don't think is in the room. And, uh, and um, Clive and I have worked together for a long time on, on things like this. Let's have a... So here's the object of interest. Uh, we've all got one of these. It booted up nicely in all our cases. And uh, a kilogram and a half of wetware. Where does all this come from? Where... How can I do all this? Uh, how can I feel like I do? Uh, um, I'm going to try and model the human cortex. And that's going to involve setting up a network with 1 billion to 10 billion neurons. We're going to model a node at the neuron scale. So, good morning. Uh, so these are... Uh, very, very large networks for simulation by anybody's standards. And uh, we'll see why. It's going to be a highly modular network, a network of networks, really. Um, it, network theory we call modules, the tightly connected sort of clustered bits. And then these might be more loosely connected into a sort of loose network of tightly connected networks, if you see what I mean. And each module contains about... 10,000 neurons or so, we'll see these later. Um, um, we, I started off from a question of what's, what sort of information processing can a single module do? And the sort of more general version of that is if can we focus on the inner life of the complex dynamical system we're talking about? Well, you know, what's going on in there when we try and make it do stuff, when we, we force it, when we stimulate it? What actually goes on in producing a response? And for that, we have to have a dynamical uh, model active at each independent neuron. And the model we're going to have, it doesn't really matter which model you choose, but they've all got a similar property that they are excitable. So if, if, if I'm downstream of Mr. Neuron over here and he sends a, 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 a sooner or later that's going to arrive, that spike, and then I'm going to get excited. But then after I'm excited, there's a refractory period. So if he sends another one down or someone else sends another, I'm not ready and I don't respond. And then after a bit, I'm ready and then I'm ready to go again. Um, everybody happy with that? Great. I always think of the Mexican wave in a football ground where if the football ground's quite big, you take part in it and then the wave goes around and comes back and you're ready to go again. But if the football ground was a very small one, like Oxford United's, uh, it would come around. You wouldn't want it. No, I'm not doing this again. You know, so you wouldn't, you know. Um, so it's excitable and refract. And, 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 uh, and incidentally, the, the messaging from one neuron to its neighbor takes some time. Compared to the spike, takes some non-negligible time. So it's not instantaneous. There are real numbers called time lags that are uh, mediating here. So the kind of whole is a very, very complex delay differential equation type of system. And the delays are important, as we'll see later. Um, well, uh, we can't reverse engineer my brain because we can't get down to individual neurons and watch them and see what they're doing. But we can reverse engineer such a system if we're able to produce one. We can go and have a good look. So this kind of presents its own big data problem in a way because, you know, I don't really want to look at uh, 10 billion firing uh, uh, histories. But in, in, in principle, I, I could do that if I, if I had cause to and knew what I was doing. But suppose there are sort of internal latent dynamical modes. This is what we're going to argue. 
then those would be quite good candidates for internal subjective experiences like feelings and qualia. Because, of course, uh, you could think of, I don't know, the dynamics of the brain as having lots and lots of different potential wells. And once I'm sitting in those, that will very much colour the way I deal with incoming information. So love is indeed blind. When I'm in love and my loved one's here, I'm not thinking rationally about any of you or her, him, right? So these things are about fast processing and they cut off a load of possibilities so that we don't have to constantly, our brain doesn't have to constantly think that anything can happen at any time. It's working within a reduced set of possibilities of you know, what's going to happen next or, or what's happening out there. Um, well, those sorts of internal dynamical states are really getting close to the hard problem of consciousness we'll talk about in a moment, which is, you know, what is it like to be a human being? Um, uh, so, strong emergence and weak emergence, worth just considering this. So, so there's this idea of strong emergence, which, which is troubling for people on the mathematical side, I think. Weak emergence is defined as being, this is what philosophers define as being the sort of emergence we almost always look at in complex systems. So it's amenable to some sort of mathematical analysis, there's a phase change or something, or a bifurcation, or symmetry breaking pattern formation or something like that and we're able to uh, analyze those things and then there's supposedly something else called strong emergence which refers to an emergent phenomenon phenomena in a dynamical system um, with properties that can't be simulated or understood via maths so it's sort of quite a big big ask that I gave this last time I gave this talk someone in the room definitely thought strong emergence was okay and so that's, that's fine, but I definitely think it isn't okay. Uh, why hasn't maths tackled things like um, uh, sh apparent strong emergent phenomena in brains? Well, it's because we haven't really got to the races yet. I don't think we've been lazy, but certainly we need people who are more skilled than I am in network science and dynamical systems theory to uh, rise to these uh, challenges. But, you know, this is the idea that there are strong emergent phenomena and Dave Chalmers, the philosopher, says, and there's only one example of strong emergence and it's human consciousness. So that's sort of useful from, from that perspective because it says there's no point in doing what I'm about to waste our time on for the next 40 minutes or so because you'll never get there. That's what they're saying. And I'm saying, actually, not, not only will we get there, but we haven't quite started yet. So you need to give us a little. And the reason we haven't quite started yet is plainly because of the size of the simulations I'm talking about. We can't hope to start with simulations with 100 neurons and try and develop something that's going to have, you know, we need to sort of get up there and... Um, uh, problem of hard consciousness. What, is it what does it feel like to be a human being? You know, Nagel wrote a paper, what does it feel like to be a bat? Right? What are those internal sensations and those um, experiences of the world? Um, why do we have them? I've already suggested part why I think we have them. I think they're very, very good at focusing onto the, uh, the matter at hand. Um, can't remember whether they're on this slide. You know, there's this idea of philosophical zombies. So zombies are people who look like us. They've got all, everything we've got, all the same structure, all the same chemistry, everything. And the only thing they don't have is feelings. And they're also crafty because they try and convince us all the time through their behavior that they have got feelings, right? And um, the zombies aren't going to survive this talk. Uh, so that's good news for us. But, you know, that's an interesting thought experiment, isn't it? That, but, you know, a zombie without feelings in my book would have to constantly um, uh, consider that anything might happen in the next instant. Because it's got no feelings which focus it down and sort of blinker off all the other stuff. And it's, 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 it, it's dealing with everything. And um, we know we don't do that because you know when you're thinking about a difficult problem and you're walking down the street and when it gets just to the point of real difficulty, you just stand still for a moment while you just think that and then you walk on. Right? You're just marshalling all the stuff that's going on. And uh, 
That's an evidence of the, you know, switch between the thinking slow and thinking fast systems uh, that were introduced by Kahneman and others to explain um, uh, how we uh, make decisions with bounded rationality in order to get on and do stuff. Uh, we can't be doing a Rolls Royce job all of the time. In fact, we get so used to using those so-called heuristics that we have to consciously work hard not to use them. So I always said to my mum, you know, I want to be a mathematician. And my mum said, why do you want to be a mathematician? I said, because I haven't got any common sense. <laughs> so common sense will let us down as mathematicians if we try and apply our common sense. Um, oh, the term emergence is a bit of a sort of barrier, isn't it? Do we really need emergence as an engine for consciousness? I'm not sure. Of course, there's the philosopher's desire to have an impenetrable engine so that consciousness, you know, it, phenomena suddenly appear kind of in parallel with the physicality of the brain. Um, and then they don't have to bother about how it happens because we've just agreed that we will never be able to do that. So, um, uh, um, how far can we get from building up from what we know already? So, over the past 30 years or so, there's been a huge amount of work on systems which are a bit brain-like, um, sort of coupled um, dynamical systems and in, coupled up in modular ways and things like that. So we actually know quite a lot about the dynamical systems. What we don't know is about uh, um, how this would work at real scale or size. And... Um, Going back to my original question, what kind of work can these systems do? So at the end, I'm going to confess one of the reasons I'm doing this is because I believe strongly that one day you might have two computers sitting on your desk. You'll have a computer that's very good at logic and arithmetic. That's called your Macintosh. So when you want to fill out your, expectation, uh, your, your expenses form, you know, it's doing all that and adding it all up correctly. And then you'll have another uh, computer on your desk, which is a bit like my mum who can make a decision off very sparse information and is pretty assertive. So you'd say, do I know that chap? And they go, no, you don't really know him. In fact, you don't like him, I don't think. You know, it will just have an opinion on everything. And it will be hopeless at logic and arithmetic. Good at decision making, hopeless at logic and arithmetic. Um, that would be a very different type of um, system which would be very useful for people, um, you know, security forces, soldiers, people like So it's no surprise, is it, that DARPA are interested in non-binary computation. Um, and, of course, the analogue of the human brain offers a, 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 a great opportunity to think about this. And almost anything you all say in this conference this, this week <laughs> offers us all a little bit of food for thought over whether there could be other types of systems that could sit on the shoulder of people in certain circumstances making decisions and advise them in some way, a bit like their mums. Um, okay, um, so I'm thinking of the brain as a rather vast non-binary information processor. It's a sort of analog information processor, isn't it? With all these <coughs> things spiking and all these neurons talking to each other. Inside, it, it ought to have some internal subjective latent felt states, and those would bias the immediate incoming. And um, I've mentioned philosophical zombies. We'll return to those in the bullet point later. Um, but higher order facets of consciousness are really front of the day. I'm really focusing on what's going on inside and whether these are candidates for feelings or not. That might, that's all. That's all we're doing. So the architecture, this is fairly standard, so I just rip these off. Um, uh, Wikipedia, but the idea is the cortex has a load of vertical columns through it. Here's alleged pictures of such columns. And these are the tightly connected um, clusters, or we're going to call them columns or, or, or modules, would be a graph theoretic term. Um, very tightly connected, lots of them almost, lots of them talking to each other. And then they're arranged in a, in a sort of a layer across the cortex 
which of course is concertine it up for efficiency, but if it was stretched out, there'd be sort of layer across. And there's torque up and down within the columns, that's the stuff going on in here. And then there's a little bit of torque across the columns to neighbors or near neighbors. I've, I've just drawn it like that. But you get the idea that you've got something like that stretched over the cortex, and this is doing all the work. So this is a uh, pathetic version of, of, of a layer wrapped over here I suppose but we've got to have a model and, and that's ours and we can just think about the numbers because we want uh, there to be about 10,000 neurons in each of these and we want to have about a thousand by a thousand a million of those right, which would give us the uh, 10 billion neurons that we want to that we wish to simulate and uh, Chris and I are probably the only two in the room who think this isn't mad. So that's what we're, that's the journey we're on. Not going to get there by the end of today. Okay. Um, so single neurons will have excitable and fractury dynamics. And if you want a dynamical system, you could have a Fitsu Nagumo or Hodgkin Huxley caricature or something like that. Um, you could have something that was discrete, which was passing these around just remembering firing times, um, or many others. Um, uh, you pay your money and take your choice. I mean, obviously, the more complicated things, states you have going on at each neuron is going to be, uh, you know, put a big cost on the, on the compute. And remember, it's, 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 it's not just updating time. You've got all these delay equations, really. So you've got to keep remembering who fired when and when you're going to hear that. And, you know, this is, this is something that's very easy to, to um, substantiate in a brain because it's all done physiologically with cells and delays and travel times and stuff like that. And it's very difficult to, uh, to um, instantiate this on a binary platform called a computer because we've got to chase up all these uh, pesky, pesky details. Um, I mentioned the IBM non-binary. This is interesting. So for a few years, IBM on the West Coast have been looking at sort of um, the architecture I drew would be kind of like the architecture they like. They've been looking at those and feedback forcing in those sorts of things. And um, uh, with one proviso, which I really don't like, they make the travel times, the updating times, integers. So then you only need to update the whole thing on the tick of a clock. And by direct simulation, we can show that if we allow them to be, if we allow the lags to be real numbers, then we get a certain amount of behavior. Um, we'll see some of that in a minute. And if we force the legs to be integers, this quenches. And so the dynamical systems have far fewer degrees of freedom that they can exhibit. So really, you know, a key thing is the fact that, you know, there's these tortuous connections. And this introduces time lags, which are, you know, drawn from some distribution, but they're not all the same. And they're not integers in particular, is the, is the mathematical or the IBM way. So I wrote to them and I said, you know, look, you're making a big mistake here because, blah, blah, blah. but they, you know, imagine, imagine them giving that up. They then have to solve the thing in real time and they get into all the delay differential equations that we've got, you know, so they so very reluctant to do that. But nevertheless, if you do the experiment where you can choose between integers and reals, you can see very easily how this suppresses the types of dynamics. What do I mean by dynamics? Let's have a look. Um, uh, we're going to have a reverse engineering methodology. So we can see everything in our synthetic simulation. And uh, we're going to try and look for internal patterns that are subjective and internal to the. So here's an example. Take 10 vertices, 10 neurons wire them together, give them all a dynamic, um, kick it off with a spike at vertex number one here, then number 10 fires, then number nine, and, and, you know, and it sort of settles down into a bit of a pattern after a bit. This is just free running. We hit it once, kick-started it, and then it settled down into an aperiodic pattern. And uh, so a good question is, why do we have a network of networks in the cortex? Why not just have one other type of uh, network with a giant component. Why do we have to have a network of networks? Well, we see very easily by thinking about this. Um, so it's like we can predict this with a, a few simulations in a pen and pencil, and that tells us what we, gives us, gives us the answer. Um, well, if it settles down into an aperiodic pattern, then um, a single module or, or column 
settles down to pattern. It might settle down to a one-dimensional periodic pattern, which is called a limit cycle. It might settle down to a two-dimensional aperiodic pattern, which is a winding map over a torus. Right? And for obvious reasons, I haven't drawn a winding map over three-dimensional and four-dimensional tori. But there are ways to measure the dimension of the attractor. You kickstart it, run it, and measure the dimension of the attractor, and that tells you, you know, how many different types of thing this single column can do. And then we're going to you know, put them all together. But let's look at single columns. So when you do this, you, you know, what are the candidates? Fourier transform is a great candidate. Here's a load of spiking going on at you know, six different neurons at the top. And you can kind of see there's a periodic pattern here. And then these three have got an extra um, frequency involved. So this is a winding map over the two-dimensional torus, the surface of the donut T2. Um, Another candidate is something called state space embedding, which is you sort of take the time series of the inter spike series, so the times between successive spikes, and then you do a bit of magic called state space embedding, which is really a sort of rather large correlation matrix and, and an eigen analysis of that. And then you project it up into the first few, few uh, dimensions, and you'll get a picture of the, uh, of the attractor. This is a marvellous thing, rule tokens embedding theorem for dynamical systems. It's a wonderful thing. It's as if you've got enough of a dynamical system, you can <coughs> construct a picture which is diffeomorphic to the original <coughs> attractor of the equation. And um, so we can do this, and we can make an estimate <coughs> for k, which is the number of degrees of freedom on the torus, as a function of n, which is the number of neurons I've got in the column. Um, and I can go, actually what we used to do, we used to do it both ways and only accept results where it agreed. Um, but there's obviously some bias there. These are the sorts of results you get. And this shows the sort of size n of a, of a clock. And this shows the distribution of degrees of freedom we can achieve. And you'll notice 5, 10, 20. This is, this is um, going off like log n. So it goes off like the number of degrees of freedom is goes off like the expected number would go off like the log of the size of the column. So this is why you have a million columns and you don't have 20 columns that are all enormous. Because it's more efficient if you want to get the total number of degrees of freedom of the system up in order to have lots of little ones which are big enough to be robust because the two things that are constrained in your brain is energy, where you're short of energy, you have to use energy as efficiently as possible, so you don't want big clocks, you don't want big clusters. And the other thing that you need uh, is uh, to be, you're short of space. Um, brains can only be of a certain size for mammals, and uh, for obvious physical reasons at birth. And uh, so, um, this says immediately, well, if evolution was designed in a brain's network, it would be a network of networks. Of course, we know the answer, so that's no big, but I'm only saying. You know, when you start to see things like that in modeling, start, you know, if this had been you know, like a quadratic dependence, you know, we'd have had to go, something's wrong, we'd have had to go back to the drawing board, but it isn't. Um, no, so we want to couple those k-dimensional clocks together, and we're imagining um, a million of those k-dimensional clocks, each with 10,000 neurons in, so k is quite large, and, uh, uh, and each is a kind of winding dynamic. And what happens when one such clock drives another? That's a great question, because there's been about 40 years of work on coupled one-dimensional clocks. It's a great subject. Steve Strogut still spent a large part of his career in there, and um, it goes back to things like the Kuramoto equations, which is a a continuum version of the same thing, except this time we've got delays. So it's not quite as easy as uh, we used to think, because now we've got to associate for all of these uh, delays. But nevertheless, there's quite a large body of work on coupled clocks, and coupled clocks in continuum, as well as sort of large networks. And, but there's almost no work on coupled k-dimensional clocks. And um, the k is 3. So this is the three torus. You just identify the front and back together and the two sides together and the top and bottom together, and you can move around periodically in that. That's the three torus. And these surfaces are the surfaces on which um, forced 
um, re responses to forcing would appear. And uh, this is a kind of bifurcation diagram of, of the sorts of um, uh, response that we can get by forcing uh, such a clock at different periods and with different intensities. We're not going to go there today, but I'm just pointing out there's a really good area of, of uh, dynamical systems theory here, which has been very, very little done, except that some of the problems are analogous to problems when k is 1. And there's quite a lot there to rest on. So this is quite good PhD material, I think, because um, uh, uh, and that's what we're going to know about. Don't worry about the equations. Um, so uh, one more thing about feelings. So when I was doing this a few years ago, um, I struck up with Dave Chalmers and sort of, you know, he says, oh, there's always an explanatory gap here. Um, why would feelings just arrive as a result of the dynamics in the architecture? Maybe your feelings arise as something else. So I said, well, what else is there? And we sort of thought, well, maybe there could be noise. So there's a load of noise in the system. So if you're feeling blue or feeling happy, that's just because of the noise whizzing around. Um, or it could be to do with some sort of bifurcation, like an instability, pattern forming instability. It can't be due to either of those, and I'll tell you why. It's because if you want to feel happy, you can think of a collage of happy things and go to the happy place. If you want to feel sad, or you can think of loved ones who've died, of lacrimose music, and it makes you feel sad, doesn't it? You can go there. You don't have to sit around waiting for a bifurcation to take place. You don't have to wait for an instability, do you? You can go straight there. And so I like to think that sort of idea, I think of it as a collage of um, precursor events, and then they give you that internal feeling. And uh, because you can sort of bring that to mind, it shows that that can't be a function of noise or, or, or instabilities. Um, of course, internal modes, actually, they would immediately bias what's coming in next. So it's a form of fast thinking. And um, I'm going to argue that we have those solely as a function of dynamics and architecture. Um, so how are we going to do these simulations? Well, here's a single column, not a very big one yet, uh, with 20-odd uh, um, things on it. Supposing this with a whole brain, um, then what we could do, we could force it at different vertices. So the top one is where I've picked vertex number one, and I've, I've, I've pinged it as if it's getting some internal input from a, a source, my eye or my ears or something. And uh, this settles down into a pattern, and there's a distinctive pattern uh, produced there. And then here's the same thing with, um, with vertex number 11, and I ping that, and actually the pattern isn't the same. The response pattern, which is a dynamic pattern across the brain and, and in time, is very different. And uh, so we say, well, you know, how many, are the, how many different patterns are there in this column? And so what we can do, we can, we can make a matrix of uh, all the different experiments. So there's 20 neurons here, so there's up to 20 experiments. And we can look at the uh, um, uh, behavior, the timing of the different firings of neurons in those experiments as rows. And then if we want to compare two patterns, we can compare two rows of this performance matrix. And if they're the same, then they're producing the same sort of pattern. And if they're a long way apart, they're producing a very different type of pattern. So he would be very different from him, say. And uh, so that's what we're trying to measure, a kind of distance between a response pattern. But here we're only working for one, one clock, so we can do this. Uh, when you do that, you can form up a distance matrix, or in this case, it's a similarity matrix. It could be one over the distance. And um, if you sort of cunningly reorder uh, these, looking for um, uh, 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 blocks through reordering, which says that there are blocks of similar patterns, you get down to about four patterns in this sort of area. So um, arguably, we've got four different types of patterns there, which is how I chose those exemplars. So 11 is very different from 1 and, and, and so on like that. But you can see that we've developed a problem here called analyze, you know, run the, the system, then extract uh, something from the response, in this case of a single column, but in a minute it will be of a, of, a, of a putative brain, and then try and classify that response into one of a number of distinct kind of modes. Um, 
Now, nothing works as sweetly as we hoped. And so when we get these modes, they'll be classified in some sort of tree. And so arguably, this is sort of highly uh, discriminating uh, modes. And then at the top, there are bigger global modes. So these might be successive divisions of happiness or something or, 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 or sadness. Um, but some of these things might be corresponding to quite, you know, um, feelings which are almost sort of one to one with things like, you know, the feeling of, you know, stroking a cat or your dog or, you know, the blueness of blue. And those sorts of things, but they, they add up and they sit in some sort of hierarchy because that's the nature of the game. Um, so here's our model again. Uh, we've got k vertices in each clock and we've got m squared clock. So n is equal to k times m squared and we want that to be large. Um, um, uh, so how are we going to do it? We're going to um, give out some uh, time lags. We're going to give out some excitable and refractory dynamics to every neuron. Uh, we're going to generate a network of the required type. We're going to designate a subset of the neurons to be monitored. So typically this will be about a handful for each module. Um, we can't really deal with them all because they're going to be 10 billion in the end. So actually, uh, you know, that would be beyond current capabilities. But um, I'm trying to argue that these, um, these, this internal life is robust to a whole range of assumptions. Like it doesn't really matter if you're Hodgkin, Huxley, or Fitzunagumo, or discrete. It does. It can't depend on that. If it depends on that, we can go home now, right? Right. You know, we've all managed to do this. You know, it can't be that that unstable or that delicate, right? We're looking for really robust responses from systems like this because we own one each. Um, we're going to carry out a load of forcing terms. We're going to pick different points of the brain. We'll carry out a number f, which is roughly the same as r, um, to periodic forcings, p periodic forces. And then we'll look at the, uh, the outcomes. Um, they're phase vectors. You know, when I said similarity and things like that, you've got to remember that all of these are phases. And so there's a bit of faffing around there. Um, uh, Chris will fill in the uh, details for everybody. Uh, but it's a bit tricky, isn't it? Because we're really concerned with whether neuron five fired ahead of or behind neuron six and things like that. And so it's really only phase differences that matter. So, so when we compare them, we have to remember that we can add or subtract two pies all over the place to a heart's content in order to optimize. And then we can form up the uh, pairwise distance or similarity matrices, and then we'll have a good go at some sort of clustering to try and find these hidden modes. And what I suppose we'd like to find is a sort of fairly uniform distribution of such modes. We don't want, you know, a single dominant mode, uh, really. Uh, so here's a slightly bigger example. So there's 900 uh, neurons. This would have been large a few years ago by any standards. And um, we've got two ways of seeing this. But you can see the modules, and there's a little bit of coupling. Uh, between the modules. Um, when you do this program, you end up with a sort of fairly um, uh, consistent um, breakdown of, of, uh, of uh, response patterns, in this case to 135 separate experiments. So we can have a look at the similarity matrix when it's been suitably reordered. And um, uh, let's do a bigger example. So, this is a much bigger example. So now we get, it's a bit more like it. We're getting K as 1,000. Remember, K has to get up to 10,000 in the end. And M's 16. So we've got 256 columns. And so we've got uh, just over a quarter of a million neurons. And we've got 134 million directed synapses. Most of the synapses are inside the clocks, inside the columns, because they're very densely connected. And then there's a few that are going across in, 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 in the grid, as we showed on the graph. And, and uh, so we could do that in a computer in the Maths Institute. So this is the sort of distance matrix that occurs from that. And it, yeah, we still get this. We don't want this dominated by you know, one or two you know, big areas. We want it to be kind of, you know, it's kind of uniform breakdown as much as possible. And we would argue that you know, these were inner modes that we can't uh, guess by looking at the outside of the brain, but that's what's going on. And that's what's coloring the response. And they'll be robust. You could think of them as little sort of potential wells that the brain starts to sit in. And then you'd have to have a lot of stimulus to get you out of that and into another well. That's the way to think about them. Um, 
And again, it gives, this is distance, so um, uh, these are all very close together. And this is a very long way away from this block. Uh, it's got yellow values in there. So this is the sort of satisfactory nature that we want. Um, and we've done about 256 experiments. So I guess we've, we've, we've perturbed a, a, a random neuron in each one of the columns and then it infects its column and then its neighbors and then we take the pattern and see what happens. Okay, so last example, which is a bit more like it. So K is now 10,000 and the probability of any two neurons in each one of those clocks being connected is a half. It's very densely connected, very densely connected. Uh, this gives us 12.8, thanks Chris, 12.8 billion uh, directed uh, uh, synapses to deal with. So imagine the scale of the delay differential equations we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, not very accessible until, you know, fairly recently in terms of uh, computing power. And then we're monitoring about three neurons per clock, and we're going to do 256 experiments, and we can, we can run this. And, and we, we, you know, the phenomenon we've seen is robust, that we're scaling up and we, we might get a few more or less in here, but we're seeing fairly uniform division into these internal dynamical modes. And those modes are the things that will um, uh, control our experiences. So, so far so good. Um, now, a number of people in industry have told me that actually there are points of big phase change when you get out to really enormous systems. And this has been seen allegedly in other types of systems which are not unrelated, such as you know, vast machine learning systems and things like that. So when we started doing this, one of my colleagues, Clive, said, oh, well, you know, we, we've done it now. We don't really need to go, you know. It's a, but actually, it, that's not necessarily so. There, there's knowledge from uh, these other areas of AI in particular, which says that there may be stuff lurking out there and we just haven't got there yet. So we do intend to sort of flog on and, and do that. So how are we going to do that? Well, we've looked at a class of highly modular complex systems, networks of networks, and we've had these time lags, which are distributed reals that are fixed uh, for each system. Uh, we've had to choose some excitable and refractory uh, dynamics and always suitable parameters and all that faff. We've shown that these possess a kind of inner life. It, you know, whatever happens to them, however they're stimulated, they tend to fall into one of a quite large set of, of discrete modes. Um, these internal responses can be classified, really, is what I'm saying. And so such modes, modes could be represented as we have done in a hierarchy, although uh, uh, this hierarchy is a consequence of their discovery, actually. Um, so human brains, which are of this class, m must behave similarly. You've got these modes in your brains because your brain is one of this class of systems. And we haven't made too many assumptions about it. And there they are. So you've probably got latent modes which are biasing immediate responses. And depending on how you're wired, some people might be better at that than others. So obviously, if you could train your brain to be particularly wired, um, you know, maybe a religious man can get into higher states of consciousness because they, they've worked at it. Maybe wine tasters, professionals, Lionel, maybe wine tasters could, you know, you know be more discerning and, 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 you know, have better set of qualia to describe their experience. So, you know, during, since this is developed, as the brain develops, it's also possible that we could have people who are not very good at feelings and emotions. Who ever thought of that could happen, right? I mean, that's quite reasonable, isn't it, with this sort of model? Um, uh, right, well, philosophical zombies are impossible, sadly, because philosophers have had a great deal of fun with these, including the zombie blues and other things from, from Dave Chalmers. And, but look, I'm saying if a, if, a, if a zombie has a brain with wiring like yours and dynamics like yours, then it has inner feelings like you. This isn't something separate that somehow is overlaid in some mysterious and magical fashion. This is biochemistry, right? And so a zombie, if, he, if he's wired like you and um, if he or she has the same dynamics, then they have internal feelings just like this. And those are um, good candidates for 
qualia, feelings, uh, those sorts of things. So how are the numbers going to scale up? Well, we got to here, um, didn't we? Somewhere like there. And um, we need to get to here, 10 to the 10. So, so M is going to have to be 1,000. So we've got a million columns and, and uh, 10,000 neurons in these. And we need to get up there in some, you know, to see if there's any, any other things we can see in dynamics that start to occur at very large values. And so our solution to this is to use the Spinnaker platform at the University of Manchester. I don't know, do, do people know about Spinnaker? Yeah, one or two. Well, uh, what they've arranged, is, rather expensively, is a computer platform with a million cores. So we're a potential good user for uh, our friends in Manchester because all we need to do is to get our architecture generated and mapped onto their core structure and then we'll be able to run things of the right kind of size. We, do, we don't have an option to do that any place else. So, you know, but isn't it wonderful that just when you needed a massive computer in the United Kingdom, one exists. And uh, so we're now sort of on the user trail of that and we're working with Manchester to try and find efficient ways to generate giant networks of this type, to impose them on the net and then to do all the the delay dynamics, you see, that's problematical because if I've got lots of um, uh, neurons capable of sending me messages, then once they've fired, I've got to sort of remember somewhere in the system that I'm going to get a message at such and such a time, and then I'll listen to it if I'm not refractory or I'll ignore it if I'm in a refractory period. And so you can see that there's actually quite, you know, as they generate quite a number of neighbours, so if you've got... Um, 10,000 close neighbors in your clock, you might be connected to 50 or 60% of those, then there's a very large inventory of incoming. And of course, you're not going to respond to, to, to all of it. So oh, why does this matter to, to us? Well, clearly, it's a, it's a quest. And I think what's nice about the consciousness uh, thing is that we can all come at this from very different directions and here we've had a sort of very physicalist kind of model trying to look at what the consequences are of what we know and to, to, to show that this is consistent with um, our experiences of, uh, of, uh, of information processing with some facets, limited facets of, of consciousness. Um, of course, there may be a possibility of moving this sideways to develop if we could understand what was going on, maybe we could instantiate these systems on chips in some way that had the right architecture and the right sort of delays and the right sort of microdynamics. And uh, then we could have a different sort of device on our desk. And uh, it would be poor at logic and arithmetic and very good at making quick decisions. So it fits well into the thinking fast and slow thing from Kahneman. And I think of it like my digital mum always offering an opinion, no matter how little she knows about the actuality. Um, such platforms could be built and instantiated in some way. And I think that's a great opportunity for maths, computer science, and all of consciousness science to kind of come together and say, if we knew about what was going on there, we could attempt to build some, uh, some uh, conscious devices. Thanks very much, everybody.